Hello and welcome to Newspeak. I'm Peter Whittle. As usual, very pleased to be joined by our senior fellow, Rafe Hadermanku, historian, royal commentator, and Amy Gallagher of Stand Up to Work and also the STP's candidate for the London mayoralty. Um, before we talk about the week's events and news, just a one notice here, we have one of our locals events, this time in London. We've got a very good branch in London. Uh, and it's on this coming Wednesday in the evening, March the 6th. Now, uh, we've had a great response to this. Only a few places left uh, to come along. Um, but if you would like to, it's worth a try. Um, best thing to do is to write to locals at newcultureforum.org dot uk uh, we have a speaker there in fact it's amy um amy you're going to be speaking what are you going to be talking about oh or I'm haven't you even thought yet <laughs> <laughs> i have thought a little bit so i'm going to be talking yeah talking about london obviously london is the place where we are experiencing the most kind of politicization yeah. everywhere yeah. Um, and and we're, we're feeling it more sharply than anyone else okay. obviously your documentary did well it obviously spoke to people about the yeah. decline in london and the pro the pro Palestinian riots and the atmosphere more generally, and how we can push back and what we can do and what NCF are doing and what other smaller political parties are doing. So I'll be talking a little bit along those lines. Right. And you'll be there as well, won't you, Rafe? And uh, indeed, Philip Kisley, uh, hopefully, mm -hmm. will be there too. So that is actually on Wednesday, six of March. Um, do you get in quick because it's uh, it's filling up. Um, Obviously, there's one topic that's dominated this week. This time last week, actually, we were talking about one thing, and that was about the threat of Islamism and the various uh, dangers to our parliamentary procedures, and indeed the growth in intimidation, which is happening, has been happening all over the country uh, at local events, and indeed, actually, uh, in the by-election this week. Uh, just before it, we actually had the reform candidate uh, receiving death threats. Uh, so it's been a very worrying time. However, here we are a week later, and uh, by magic almost, the whole issue has changed to one of Islamophobia. Um, Rafe, starting with you, this is down to obviously uh, what one man said, or rather, should I say, it was used and just basically grabbed with both hands, wasn't it? Uh, Lee Anderson talking specifically about Sadiq Khan and quote, uh, his, his mates are in control of London, something like that. Do you think that actually the, apart from the distracting element, which I think there's a very strong point there, do you think it's also that it's because he mentioned Khan by name that this has caused such a fuss? I think so. I mean, even people in his own party, of course, the One Nation Tories, think that by bringing in a person, a person into the discussion, that went that went a step too far. But it's always the case, isn't it, that whenever Islamism raises its ugly head, the British establishment, establishment immediately seek to deflect attention away from that. Yeah. And I sort of wish people like Lee Anderson and others, in a way, would actually be more careful with their speech in the immediate aftermath because it give, the, the, the Labour Party and the BBC and others are just desperate to find anything which they can suddenly make an alternative news story. And here we are, even on, you know, on this show everywhere, talking mm -hmm. about Lee Anderson and Islamophobia, mm -hmm. when we should be talking about the real issue, which is the threat of Islamism mm -hmm. to our democracy. Mm -hmm. We've had you know, MPs uh, being having their lives threatened, and yet we're talking about essentially a Westminster bubble issue about what one lone MP said. And of course, it was also just a few days ago that the speaker himself, the very man who bowed down to Islamism and changed parliamentary procedure uh, out of an alleged concern for Labour MPs uh, death threats on Muslims, he then went on to talk about far-right extremism yeah. being the real issue at yeah. play here, yeah. Yeah. not Islamic extremism, as if the huge furore in which he enveloped himself was it meant nothing at all. I mean, it's, it's, it's clear to anybody what's going on here, mm -hmm. and we need to call it out when we see it. And now, of course, everyone is discussing Islamophobia. And even on the Daily Politics show on BBC yesterday, Baroness Kennedy and others were accusing Lee Anderson of racism. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Islamophobia is not racism, for one. Christianity is not a race. Islam is not a race. Mm. 
And the second point is, Islamophobia is a completely nonsense term mm -hmm. that needs to be expunged from all of our vocabularies. It was coined by the Muslim Brotherhood, a prescribed terrorist organization of extremists. It was then brought into mainstream discussion by Trevor Phillips and the Running Me Trust in the 1990s. And it is an insidious threat to free speech because it essentially conflates uh, it conflates um, uh, criticism of Islam with anti-Muslim hatred. We should be talking about anti-Muslim hatred. Mm -hmm. Lee Anderson has been accused of being Islamophobic, not for anti-Muslim hatred, but for raising genuine concerns about the rise of Islamic extremism. I think the thing is, is that the, the point there really, in a way, is that um, what he said was no more radical than, in fact, I'd say a bit less than what Suella Braverman said about the country generally. The difference was that she kept it vague, if you know what I mean. She didn't specifically talk about City Council. I would have to say that, you know, Lee Anderson has actually acquitted himself pretty well, I think, since I've seen him in interviews. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, whatever you think of him, he has not, so far anyway, apologised. And this has got to be the most important part. Stop apologising, I'd say. But I mean, this point about Islamophobia mm. that Rafe raises there, there is actually, uh, I mean, a new, I say new definition is a few years old now, but it, it specifically says it's racist. This is the one that the Labour Party has actually adopted, which therefore will probably be in our law. Yeah, well, Sadiq Khan has already come out and said that Lee Anderson's statement was racist. Mm. Um, all Lee Anderson said was that Sadiq Khan is looking after his mates. And I don't, I, I, think, the, I think we've had a complete overreaction to this. It, I mean, it's, most people agree that Sadiq Khan seems to have a double standards when it comes to talking about certain groups. And that we, these pro-Palestinian riots that are happening every weekend, which are very overtly anti-Semitic, he doesn't comment them, on them very much. Mm. Um, there was recently a, a genocidal statement being projected onto the, onto the Big, Big Ben monument. Um, to the river to the sea mm. and he hasn't even condemned that now Can you imagine if there was a far-right? Uh, mm. Slogan being projected mm. onto a monument or if there were far-right protests every weekend You know he would come out and be condemning them as much as, as possible. Yeah. So to say that he he exhibits um, Favoritism towards certain groups to me. That's just obvious So yeah. I, I, I agree with Lee Anderson and I'm really angry actually at the overall response. I expect the left to go crazy in response to Lee Anderson. But what has annoyed me is actually there are lots of um, conservative established GB News, The Spectator, various others that have absolutely turned on Lee Anderson and tried to completely disown themselves from him as much as possible. And what, what they are feeding into is this idea that the left can say anything, but the right have to be absolutely perfect. They cannot say anything that could be considered to be slightly politically incorrect. And if they do, they have to be disowned and got rid of and yeah. that is what has really annoyed me about all of this and all the people saying oh Lee Anderson should have, shouldn't have said it because then all the attention's on him and it raises Islamophobia but it's it's the whole thing of that we are feeding into this idea that we have to that our side has to be absolutely perfect and we can't express any uh, you know um, anger or upset at Sadiq Khan or his favoritism or anything the thing is you see is that you know not being able to express anything mm. um, notionally at the moment even though islamophobia exists we are you know notionally we are but this new definition i'm sorry to go on about this this is the one that all parties except for the tory party have accepted although actually the tory party will probably go along with it if you know what i mean but it, it will be embedded in new legislation it says that anything is a uh, islamophobia is about muslimness or perceived muslimness now, what does that mean? Does that mean that, for example, if you don't believe that the burqa should be allowed, that, no. that automatically, mm. therefore, that's not allowed? You, you this, can't, is the, yeah. this is why this, this is so dangerous. So yes, you're right, every single parliamentary party, apart from the Conservative Party, has signed up to this. The Labour Party expects currently all of its councils across the country to abide by this definition of Islamophobia. And all it takes is one person to perceive something that we say on this channel or, in, or on the street, to perceive that as being Islamophobic, for it to actually potentially fall foul of being Islamophobic and become a criminal offence. That includes things like if you criticise polygamy, the Muslim practice of polygamy, oh, well, that could be now. You know, it may even uh, apply to criticism of Muslim grooming gangs and the way we talk about that sort of a subject. This is an extremely chilling 
um, threat to free speech. We've been lucky so far because the Conservatives have been in power, but the fact of the matter is, uh, you know, the, the, the Labour Party is so dependent upon the Muslim vote, and Muslims are disaffected now because of the Labour Party's stance on Gaza. As a result, when Labour comes into power, it's almost certain that they're going to try their very best to appease the Muslim vote. And one of the ways they're going to do that, we know, is by, by, by introducing this either as standalone legislation or by incorporating it into its new race equality bill, race which equality said it's going to be coming out with. And this is coming down the line, and we should all be very afraid about this because it's going to have a chilling effect on free speech. Do you think, though, you know, this point about this distracting mm -hmm. story, uh, for example, Sir David Amos, when he was murdered, we talked about this, I think, last week, you know, there was this distraction. Oh, they talked about social media instead. The far right thing is uh, this kind of phony bogeyman mm. uh, going, going way back. I mean, going way back now, I remember on the London Assembly, the, the uh, what was her name, uh, Cressida Dick, quite clear, this is our main threat. When you actually scrutinize it, it was kind of highly theoretical, you know? And the fact is, what is it, something like 90% of people who are on the kind of watch list, uh, the services, uh, the security services mm. watch list is, uh, is Islamists. Mm. Um, no question about it. Do you think people surely have seen what's going on now in terms of this kind of, you know, dead cat thing, this, this distracting, do they, do, mm -hmm. It's so mm -hmm. blatant now, isn't it? Well, what's going to happen is that this new Islamophobia um, idea is going to is going to mean that even even f uh, organisations like Prevent can't function properly because how can you mm -hmm. how can you contact Prevent and say you're worried about some some kind of mm -hmm. Islamic extremism when you're not supposed to comment on it and you're worried that you might be Islamophobic? So it's going to mean that more and more we're increasingly unable to talk about this issue at a time when it's increasing and we need to talk about it more. Um, and as you said, it's it's Islamophobia. I don't, it, as Lee Anderson has said, it's essentially a blasphemy law. Mm. Is Islam isn't a person; it's a set of ideas. And to say that you're phobic of it, that you have an irrational fear of it, I am fearful of ex Islamic extremism. But it's not irrational. It's based on the fact that it, you know people go around mm. slaughtering people and bombing people and murdering people in the name of this mm -hmm. extreme religion. Mm -hmm. um, and it's going to make it harder and harder for people to disagree with it. Um, we're already seeing that now, that people are having to apologise for just mild statements about what, what they're seeing. Mm. Um, yeah. I think the problem as well is that the huge amount of self-censorship is internalised. Yeah. You know, so yeah. consequently, I mean, I don't think there's any part of society which has not internalised no, this. I mean, the best way most people deal with it, I think, is say, I'm not quite sure what I can and cannot say, so I'll say nothing. You know, and I think that is the real worry, isn't it? It's absolutely the real worry. And that's the problem here because no religion, no ideology, no way of life should be beyond uh, criticism, you know. Mm. And there's no difference between Islam and Christianity and yet, you know, people have no trouble at all criticizing the Catholic Church in the most strident sort of terms. It's no different to communism. Islam and communism, Christianity, these are in one sense ideologies, you know. And if we can criticize fascism and communism, we should be able to criticize Islam and it's also the disconnect though between our political class and the public because we know from all the polling that the public are overwhelmingly behind Lee Anderson on this mm -hmm. and yet you look at the elites and once again you just see how completely out of touch they are and they constantly seem to be pandering to a metropolitan elite viewpoint and you think what is the purpose of this I mean in another other stories we'll be discussing later as well this applies but I was looking at a few web articles which were clearly written with a metropolitan elite bias and all of the comments underneath were contradicting the article itself. Mm, mm. And you just think, do the journalists who write these articles not actually look at the comments underneath their pieces to realize that they're not actually writing for their audience? And sometimes they even turn them off. Yeah. The comments, they turn them off. I mean, I think it's, uh, it, it's without question that this is, this is a, uh, a distraction. It, it, also, it's a question of whether it's out of fear or whether it's out of a political view. Uh, held by our media and held by our establishment. Mm -hmm. I tend to the latter. I think that it's actually that they they feel that we are the oppressors. I mean, th you know, our media do, you know, um, mm -hmm. and that therefore, you know, this is an oppressed minority. I don't quite know what it would take for them to wake up on that point. But um, on the same sort of, well, very much the same topic is that um, Paul Scully, who's an MP, who was also, I think, Minister for London, 
opened his mouth this week and talked about no-go areas. Again, people are ready to leap on mm. anything. And he was talking about no-go areas in our cities. I don't think he did specify Muslim no-go areas, but nevertheless, it became a bit, bit about that. Um, and now he's apologised, right? Mm. But I don't. What, why are people apologising? I do not know. That you know, they're not going to love you for mm. it. But do you think there are no-go areas? Yeah. Well, there definitely are for Jews now. I'm pretty much London is a whole <laughs> no-go yeah. area for Jews. I know Jews that that, that don't want to go out of the, the in, in, in central London at the yeah. weekends or when there's pro-Palestinian riots. They're getting taxis rather than getting on public transport to avoid yeah. a, avoid yeah. potential harassment or hate crimes. Um, and there are across across the country. I mean, Suella Braverman's talked about this. There are um, silos of of groups that are operating at, you know, outside British, British values um, where most, people, most, most other people wouldn't want to live because they have their whole community and they would feel excluded. Um, it, it, it's, it's well documented. Mm -hmm. there, there are places that are um, operating outside of British values and there are, you know, is that the whole of London is becoming, there's lo loads of pockets in London where you wouldn't want to go to. Um, I, don't, I don't see that there's anything wrong with saying that. It's, it's the failure of multiculturalism, isn't it, that we have seen. What, what, would, you call, what would you call a no-go area? Well, no-go no zones are very difficult to actually define. So Belgium has no-go zones. Um, France has no-go zones, with, with, with North African Muslims being, being the problem there. Mm. Britain is a far better place. For the average person, uh, on a Wednesday afternoon at 3 p.m. or a Saturday afternoon at 3 p.m., there are really no-go zones, and there, there aren't any no-go zones really in this country. Mm -hmm. If you're an Orthodox Jew, or you're a Jew with a visible Jew, mm -hmm. or if you're a homosexual couple, there definitely are no-go zones 24 hours a day. But even for the average person in this country, you know, there are certain parts of this country where if you're there at 11 p.m. on a Friday night, for example, mm -hmm. uh, you would be looking over your shoulder. And we know what white men are, don't, can't go to certain areas in the, in the Midlands, in the north of England, for example. They know that they're not welcome in those areas, probably at any time of day, actually. Um, these, things, these things do exist, and it's, uh, it's something which actually we need to pay more attention to because they're only getting bigger with, with segregation. I saw, a, I saw a video on Twitter just the other day of two traffic wardens uh, being assaulted by a mob in one of these sort of very high densely populated ethnic segregated communities. You know, if you're two policemen walking together, you will be very wary about going down certain street. That's one of the definitions of no-go zones, yeah. is where policemen just would never leave their cars. Mm. And we're actually frequently seeing now police vans being attacked, police being sworn at and told to get back into your vehicles. There is a culture of intimidation. If that isn't a no-go zone, well, actually, I think, uh, I think it is. I think the thing is, it, it is a difficult one because it opens, it's open, you know, there's loads of hostages to fortune if you bring it up because it's so easy to sort of disprove in a way. Mm. Uh, you just take your reporter from The Guardian and you walk around in Tower Hamlets for a while and uh, she comes back saying, I don't see, I didn't see any problem, and I'm a woman, blah, blah, blah. You can almost hear it now. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know what I feel about these. There have always been very dodgy areas that the police didn't go in, going right back to the 50s. You know, always dodgy areas that the police would go in. Couples. I'm not sure, do you think, would you say that there are, and you say London is a no-go zone in total for Jewish people, I think you're absolutely, it's not hyperbole, mm -hmm. it absolutely is. but. When I think of no-go zones or areas, I think of sort of almost contained anarchy, i.e. that when you go into them, you're taking your life in your hands. Mm. Mm. Would you say that's yeah, what it yeah, is? Yeah, there are places like that in, in London that have become like that. There's certainly, when I was doing shift work as a nurse, I tried to avoid walking through Brixton or, or places like that because there were so, so much crime rates and you'd come out and you'd see things immediately that were really, you felt like, you're like you, know, you were in danger. Yeah. So it, it's about crime, but I mean, the media have seized on this comment by this MP and made it about race and racism and saying, well, who are you saying is not allowed to go into certain zones and why, you know, what race are you talking about? Mm. There are lots of places that you wouldn't go to for, for reasons to do with crime, but there are also places that you would, do, certain groups wouldn't go to because of fears that they would be attacked and it mm. you know there doesn't seem to be an idea that you know that any concern for, for Jewish people or other groups that would feel that they can't go into a certain area for fear of being attacked that the concern seems to me more that you're accusing those groups of of, of, of 
being being racist or, or being you know of committing hate crimes but but it, the, the statistics are there I mean we've seen since the October uh, attacks on Israel um, over 30 uh, there's been over 30 attacks on, on on Jewish property Jewish hate crimes have risen by over a thousand percent so we know this is happening and I know Jewish people are saying you know should we leave London what should we do where are we gonna wh what's wh what does our future look like so it, it is happening mm. and um, let's just remember we had clear no-go zones in Northern Ireland didn't we in Belfast mm. between Republicans mm. and loyalists right and it doesn't take ma that much of a stretch of imagination to see segregated communities in, in London and elsewhere mm -hmm. grow into such a size where they become sort of is, is Islamic, you know, types of, uh, of enclaves. And remember, we've already had an experience of that in, in Tower Hamlets, which is, you know, one of the top 10 most crime ridden parts of the country, uh, where we had the Muslim patrol, this Muslim Sharia law gang going around beating up Muslim store owners who were selling alcohol, for example, putting up, attacking homosexuals, attacking poorly dressed uh, women who were dressed in scantily cl uh, clad clothes and so forth, putting up stickers saying homosexuals can't come here, this is a Sharia zone. I mean, that is a, it's a foretaste of what's to come if people don't actually actively tackle the problem of extremism. Well, I, I was there actually in the East End last night driving through Limehouse and there were some very, you know, famous gay bars, the White Swan, which is where Michael Barrymore came out. Um, not, not exactly a thing to recommend it, maybe, but anyway, um, they're all gone, uh, all gone. Uh, but you look at it and you think, oh, this is because this is now essentially a, a Muslim area. But then a little bit of your is saying, well, wait a minute, they've closed all over the place because they are closing, you know, so don't get carried away. But um, I think that I'd agree. I remember there was someone who became very involved in the NCF for a while, a choreographer uh, with a, uh, with a uh, uh, a ballet group and he just got sick of being in, uh, insulted on Brick Lane with his partner and moved out. I mean people just sort of move out. The, the problem is, is they'll never say that's the reason, mm. most people will never say that's the reason. They'll just say quality of life or something mm. or other, won't they? This is the thing, you can't talk about it but we know privately people are having these conversations, where are we going to live in the future, where's yeah. the best, you know, everybody's saying it. You know, do, do you think, do you see yourself living in London in the next five years, ten years, are you going to move out, what are we going to do? Um, but we can't talk about it so it will just happen, mm. people will just move. Mm. And it, the well, reason, they're, they're yeah. doing that, I yeah, think they're doing yeah. that. Um, can I just, going back to our you know, previous part of this discussion, uh, Kemi Badenoch put a few words into it, didn't she, this week, uh, talking about how we should best define, you know, sort of prejudice or bigotry towards Muslims, didn't she? Um, and I think it was something about using the word, actually, you've tweeted on this as well, haven't you? Anti-Muslim, you use the word anti-Muslim. Yeah, no, no individual should be targeted because of their faith. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, everyone deserves the common courtesy unless they're in breach of the law themselves. Um, but we should treat everybody with respect. So there's a huge difference between hating an individual because of their faith mm. and, and despising or criticizing the ideology. And even, you know, even if somebody is, you know, holds, holds extreme views of any faith, they don't deserve to be physically attacked or assaulted or, or you know, or verbally, verbally shouted on the street. But that doesn't mean that we can't actually criticize Muhammad mm. or Islam or its beliefs or mm. its practices and values and culture. Mm. Well, you see, I feel that I mean, I'm, in some ways I'm kind of a real purist on this in the sense that when we have the news, uh, radio news, TV news, whatever, it is always the Prophet Muhammad. Mm. Right? It is always, that is how it's always described. And you, I feel like, are they, is he your prophet? Mm. You know, to I've the never news said that. I've never no, said You might not. And you, but on, I'd say, I think you'd agree that on our oh, media. Yes. Mm. And you sort of think, wait a minute, you know, why do you, why do you not even just simply say the Islamic prophet Muhammad? Why is it the prophet Muhammad? It's like every time that they talk about Jesus, they should have to say the son of God or something. Mm. It's utterly ridiculous. But it's so internalized now, you know. And it's the people who are, sort of virulently secularist and liberal who for some reason get very angry on behalf of Muslims. Yeah and it's just this one religion that you can't uh, cr criticise 
we, you know, we have a strong tradition in this country of, of making fun of, of Christianity. You know, the life of Brian, the Book of Mormon, fear to show, Ricky Gervais, other, of mm-hmm. Ben Elton, they all make fun of, of Christianity. And even Christians just understand that that's fair game, you know, that, that we live in a liberal society. And of course, you can make fun of, of Christianity. Um, but that doesn't apply to Islam. You don't see any of the comedians or, or any works of art or theatre yeah. shows making fun of Islam. Um, and it's because, That's of right. course, you know that they, well, their lives would be at risk, first well, and foremost. they follow through. They yes. follow through on yeah. the threats. It's as simple yeah. as that. You're not going to have the life of Iqbal. No, no. You know, mm. anytime soon. Um, just to, to, to wrap this part up, we're here we are, we've had moved right over, and here we are doing it, as you rightly say, talking about Islamophobia. When do you think actually that this issue or how will it be pulled back to what it really should be? Which is about the, the Islamist threat to our, which I see is intensifying every week. You know, How will that be pulled back? How will we get it back? How will we get that back online? It will only happen if at our own media outlets from GB News to The Telegraph uh, to the spectator and so forth, don't fall for the metropolitan elite line and keep the focus. And if they, if Tory MPs don't apologise, yeah. if they stand their ground, if they don't lose the whip, mm. if actually the prime minister had some guts and spine and actually stood up and said, you know what, Islamophobia is a nonsense term. We're going to get rid of it, and we're going to bring and say anti-Muslim hatred is a correct mm. term. Everyone should be free to criticise any religion. That's what should have been said on the st- steps of Downing Street, instead of removing the whip from Lee Anderson and sort of making this mealy mouth apology. Yes, and also getting entirely the wrong end of the stick by Sunak saying, I'm living proof that we're not a racist society. Sort of it's not really banal sentiment. I mean, He's also conceding it's the argument. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly, conceding it entirely. Mm. Um, Slightly different subject, mm. um, but uh, J.K. Rowling mm. has been, well, expressing her exasperation this week, hasn't she? Can you tell us about that? Yes, yeah, so there's a recent story of um, a, a man who's been convicted of murder. Um, it's been found to have a kind of quite extreme instances of torture in his background, torturing a cat, putting a cat in a blender, but then eventually going on to murder a mm. man. Mm. Um, and this has been presented by mainstream media as a woman. So this is a man who has um, gone through what says he's transgender. He was actually treated at the Tavistock Clinic. Um, and was on puberty blockers, which we know can alter your mood. But he's, he's a transgender man, uh, well, a man that says he's a woman and wants to be, identify as a woman. Um, but the media have been talking about this person as though they are a woman. Yeah. They're no longer even saying trans woman or, yeah, or, or yeah. a man who identifies as a woman. There was a clip of a BBC presenter saying a woman has been convicted of murder. I saw that. Um, and you know, as though, and that's it. No explanation that they're even transgender. So this is kind of even going even one step further in just accepting that how they identify is the new reality. Um, and of course, in response to this, a lot of feminists and gender crit- gender critical people have come out and said, well, "What? How? What's going on?" Um, J.K. Rowling spoke up about this. She tweeted about the fact that you know men men are committing these crimes and women are being blamed for it because they're saying, oh, it's a woman that's done this crime, or of course it's not, it's a man. And this is very important because we know that you know 99% of sexual offences are committed by men and 90% of victims of sexual offences are women. Mm-hmm. So it's it's a very important issue to do with with gender and and, and sex differences. Um, and the reaction to feminists like J.K. Rowling to, to just speak up about this has been quite remarkable. The Metro um, made a tweet saying well, that J.K. Rowling needs to shut her mouth, you know, and, and keep quiet um, about... And it's, <laughs> so we have a, a, me- a mainstream media that are defending a, a man who has committed murder and telling people like J.K. Rowling, a beloved author, to shut her mouth. I mean, she, it's yes, she says something. I'm sick of this shit, didn't she? Yes. and that's the remarkable thing, you know. Once again, just as it is with deflecting onto Lee Anderson and Islamophobia, here the deflection is away from the trans issue onto transphobia. Mm-hmm. Once again, you know, and the the actual article in the Metro, I read the actual online article, and every comment underneath that was defending J.K. Rowling again, mm-hmm. showing the disconnect between between the the, the 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 agenda setters and the rest of the rest of the public. 
But yeah, I mean, there's a couple of things going on here. Firstly, of course, you may, may remember there was a mass shooter in America recently, Audrey Hale, yes. who was a trans shooter. The moment that it was announced that she was trans, coverage of the story stopped. You could even find the date that it stopped, mm. March the 23rd, 2023. It, it stopped because that was the date it was announced. Mm. Now, had it been a white man who had a... She had a manifesto as well, this trans person. Uh, had it been a white man with a manifesto, there would have been days and days of coverage of this. All coverage stopped on that very day. That's one of the reasons people are reluctant to announce that this, that this person is, a, was, is trans because they don't want to have a discussion about this connection mm -hmm. with trans. Mm -hmm. But J.K. Rowling is quite right. If you're suddenly going to be including in crime statistics mm -hmm. trans people as women, you're going to completely skew the degree to which women actually commit crimes. Because, of course, as, as Amy said, you know, the vast majority of people committing these things are actually men. Mm -hmm. Now, this trans uh, killer, for example, also identifies as a cat and was microchipped as a cat and has a cat microchip and has a multiple personality disorder, refers to themselves as we and us and so forth. So why were they not addressed as a cat? Why were they addressed you know, as a she or a he? Mm. I mean, it just goes to why did the judges decide that? And now there's this assumption that there's actually a code of ethics as a handbook in the court system that now says that we, that it's, uh, we you must address people by their preferred pronouns uh, mm. without actually any proof of a gender certificate, for example. Mm. So you get the bizarre mm. case, for example, of a woman who's been raped having to refer to her rapist as a woman. I mean, yeah. we're getting into very, very distressing territory here. Well, getting into sort of Soviet Russia territory, actually, mm. uh, where you can, in fact, you covered this in your documentary, Heresies, yeah, yeah, last we week. Yeah, I looked at the Tavistock. This, which, this uh, yes, exactly, where it, it was kind of the, you, were gui you could be guilty of uh, reformism, yes, wasn't it? Yeah. And actually put away. It's the same kind of thing, really, isn't it? This person, this cat woman, man, uh, is actually going into a men's prison though, mm. isn't that right? Thankfully. Thankfully, but, yeah. And there's no, but there's no, there's no rule that it had to happen no. that way, but, but at least that's to be said, that's one thing. But that just goes to show you, you know, that at least the courts are doing that, whereas the, the media still yeah. by the line that, that uh, he's a woman. <laughs> Do you know, I mean, it's extraordinary that actually it's considered a a positive step that a bloke is actually going into a male prison. Yeah, you know, isn't yeah. it extraordinary? Yeah. <laughs> well, um, yes, uh, while we're on the subject, um, I mean, great documentary oh, last week. Oh, thank you, Peter. And, uh, you know, it seems we've gone down very well. I mean, uh, great. Heresies, it's still up, of course. This is YouTube. It's still up. Um, and uh, basically, uh, what is it called again? So it's called How Psychology Went Mad, Trans, Racist and Woke. So it's, uh, yeah. Look it out. Okay. Thanks so much, Amy. Thanks, Peter. Thank you, Wave. Um, we shall see you next week. Thanks, bye. Hello. If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever, and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as three pounds per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you.